Yo, Ryan Hart here. Welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast channel. These are the interview sessions where I put my curious questions to inspiring people with one goal in mind, to help you be better than you were yesterday in your heart and in your mind. While you're here spending time with us, I'd love it if you subscribed, leave a like, or maybe drop a comment below with letting us know some of your thoughts on the interview. Please do share it with someone that you'd love to help be better to. Brenly, for the second time, welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast. We were just laughing because I got kicked off then because my children are homeschooling, but welcome again. How are you? Thank you, Ryan. I'm so good. How are you? Very, very well. I'm, I'm glad that we're going to have this conversation now that I'm on a more secure internet platform. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. It happens, listen. It does happen, right? And you know, I'm sure we'll get happen. into kind of performing under pressure. Yeah. So the question I asked just before I, I dropped off is that at Always Better Than Yesterday, we love um, working with heart, doing what we love. And, 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 I, and I love the work that you do with, with mindset and, and helping the awesome people and teams that you do. So I'd love to know a little bit more about your heart work. Yeah. So like I was saying as well, <laughs> I love the podcast name, Always Better Than Yesterday. When I saw that name, it just completely hit home for me because with everything that I do, that's sort of a summary of what I believe and what I strive for in my work. So a um, little bit more background about me. I'm a mental performance coach. I work in professional sport in the National Hockey League. I also run a company, a sports psychology program based in Toronto um, called Heads Up High Performance. And I'm a, my background is in cognitive behavioral psychotherapy. So when I started out, I was a regular therapist doing regular um, counseling, but I always had a passion for sport. And it was kind of that one day when I blended those two worlds together, how, you know, my expertise was in working with people's thinking and behaviors. And then I took that and I applied it to sport and just performance in general. And that's where I found my thing. Like that was my heart and I loved it. And I knew it was my thing. And, um, you know, the rest is history, but from there, I really like all of the things that I do, I always summarize it literally in one statement. You know, it's a bunch of fancy titles, but when I, when I summarize my work in one statement, it's that I help people be and become the best version of themselves. That's what I do. So it's always better than yesterday. That's my heart. Yeah. I love it. I've been looking forward to this conversation since we connected on on Clubhouse through yeah. through Justin Sewer, and, and I know that you you guys do you do similar great work out in the world. Yeah. And um, you 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 come out of things. You, you know, on your website, you've got testimonials from an NHL team mm. and Disney. Yeah. What connects yeah. the sport world and the business world? You know what? For me, it's just about high level performance. I can literally take the work that I do. When I say it's just helping people be and become the very best that they can be. How do they grow into their full potential? You know, I always think that we as human beings have so much more inside of us. Mm. It's usually this that stops us first and holds us back. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanna do. I just wanna help people fulfill their potential. And so it doesn't matter whether it's in the sport world or whether it's in the business world, how do I help people perform at their best? And that's tackling underlying mindset. That's huge for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I feel like your mindset is going to drive your performance. It drives your behavior and then ultimately your performance. So it um, doesn't really matter who I'm working with. It's all about achieving peak level performance. Yeah, I love that. It's, um, it's uh, I think with with your book, you, you say it's, you know, the title is fearless yeah. and it's not about not experiencing fear. What is it about? Yeah, it's, you know, I love the title fearless because I really believe that fear is the biggest barrier to success. And that doesn't matter whether you're in the sports world, the business world, life in general, it's that underlying fear. Like I was saying that really, holds people back. You know, our brain's kind of naturally wired to seek comfort just by nature, right? So we like what's comfortable and it's nice to be in the comfort zone. We all need it sometimes in our life, but nothing grows there. So 
in order to push boundaries and grow to your potential, we need to break out of the comfort zone, which means we need to face discomfort and we need, we need to face our fears. So when I say fearless, it's not in the absence of fear mm -hmm. because fear is a normal part of just being human. It's a normal emotion. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people it's okay to feel fear. So it's not in the absence of fear, but it's about being able to say, you know what, I'm afraid and I can mm. do it anyways. What are some of the, the common fears of high performers? I'm honestly going to say it's fear of failure. And it's so mm. interesting because it holds true for everybody. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, I'm working with a professional athlete or an amateur athlete or somebody in the business world. It's kind of like, you know, what if I don't get there? What if I embarrass myself? What are other people going to think about me? And that was something that I found so interesting when I, you know, did make the move to the professional world. It's like, like you started, like, they're just exactly the same. Like, everybody's human, and we all have the same emotions. And I think that's important for people to know, you know, sometimes we look at these professional athletes, or these famous movie stars, and mm -hmm we think there's something different or special and, and they are special and unique in what they do, no question about it. But I really believe we all have our own uniqueness and our own specialness to us. And we all have the potential to grow into what we're capable of if we're willing, like you say, to just get better like every single day, better than yesterday. So that's, yeah, that's my thing, really. That's why, I, that's like, honestly, when I say it, it gives me chills because I, I just love the the podcast and everything that Thank you're you. doing. Yeah, I I um I saw a video of you um uh, as a young a young I think he was a tennis player opposite you and you were talking about expectation. Mm -hmm. Is expectation is it a gift or is it a curse? Well, I mean, it's interesting because for me it's a bit of a curse, mm. but I know that most people um, think it's a gift and. You know, I think it's about using it the right way. So where it becomes a curse for me, I call it the achievement curse, actually. When you're so driven to achieve, and I see it all the time because I work with competitive athletes. So they, you know, tend to have this naturally instinctive competitive drive, which is great. And this drive to do well, I'm all about it. The problem is it turns curse-like for me when the drive becomes a need, like I have to or else, mm. um, what if I don't, you know? It, when we're driving ourselves with those types of expectations, I need to be great, I need to do something, I have to achieve this. Those have tos, those must, they're really a setup for us because the road to greatness is difficult. If you wanna achieve great things, it's not meant to be easy right? If it was easy, then everybody could have it. So it's supposed to be hard. You are mm. going to fail. You will be embarrassed. You will fall flat on your face. Sometimes other people will punch you in the face physically <laughs> or mentally, you know mm. what I mean? But um, yeah, it's going to be a tough road. It's not an easy road to success. And so if it's a must and we have to achieve it, then we're constantly judging ourselves against those expectations, like on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. And then it starts happening during performance. So you, there is no doubt you'll fall short at some point. It's not always going to be perfect. Like when does life work out perfectly day-to-day -day the way we plan it? No, we have a plan and then life punches us in the face, right? So um, if we're holding ourselves to this must and have to and these expectations, so to speak, as soon as we fall short, you know, we're going to be upset. There's pressure on us. And I just feel like it causes you to judge yourself while the performance is happening. Mm. And that's what I want to pull people away from. Now, you know, again, it's all about finding the right balance for each person because sometimes that drives people, but when they're performing, you know, when they're growing, I really do like to shift it away from that into growth let's just get better every single day, you know, because no question you're going to fall short. And I just don't want that to set people up. And it does. So mm. that's the danger. Perspective on resilience. Is that something that um, comes before or after the struggle? Uh, resilience. 
for me, it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm always tackling the mindset first. I believe that it's that underlying mindset that drives behavior, right? So Mm -hmm. the way we think our perspective on things drives how we feel and based on how we feel Mm -hmm. we act. And so, you know, right. Let's say I'm worried about, I'm worried about failing right now. Like this is a huge moment you know, what if I don't, I need to be great or else that's kind of this gun to your head. Um, I'm probably going to be feeling really anxious and I'm feeling really anxious. Then how's that going to translate into my behaviors? Well, I might be tight. I might be tense. I might be hesitant. What are the consequences of performing like that in whatever you do? Probably not great. Then you fail. And then it becomes this vicious cycle, right? Like, Mm -hmm. oh my God, that was terrible. What's going to happen to me now? Like, so it just, it doesn't go anywhere. It's really hard to be resilient if that, if your thinking is based on that pressure and those expectations, right? Hard to drive resilience. So while the resilient behavior needs to come after mm-hmm. a failure or something happens, you almost need to train that mindset and that those attitudes and those behaviors prior so that when something does happen to you, that is difficult because it hurts for everybody. It's not mm-hmm. like, You know, I always say I don't encourage failure, but I discourage fear of failure. So Mm -hmm. training that beforehand, you know, and practicing it, it's literally like a muscle, that resilient muscle, like anything else, we need to strengthen it so that when we do get knocked down, you know, it's activated, we're able to access that resilient muscle and be able to push forward and continue going. Mm -hmm. I um I asked my community something recently. If given the choice, would you rather have the will or the skill? And and I heard something that you said recently, which was about uh, talent is highly overrated. Yeah. Why is talent highly overrated? Yeah, you know, people challenge me on that, Ryan, all the time. But <laughs> I'm a firm believer. I caught I caught a little clip of the Matthew McConaughey interview, and I think he was leading towards that. Um, I'm not sure what he was saying, but I definitely going to check it out. Um, and I love Matthew McConaughey. So I'm super <laughs> interested in what he was saying. Yeah. But talent is overrated. I, I'm a firm believer in that because you can have all the natural God-given talent in the world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, your natural talent is going to take you about 30% of the way towards your long-term success. Mm-hmm. And why is that and talent might get you so far and it's lovely to have if you're blessed with natural god-given talent it's wonderful and it might take you so far right you might get advantages to a certain point but at some point talent runs out so if you keep progressing in whatever field you're progressing at some point you know in the sports world you get to a level where everybody is good and everybody's excelling in their game, right? So what's the one thing that takes you from being good to really being great? And for me, it's between the ears. It's, and mm. it's that, it's the thinking which drives the will, which drives, you mm. know, everything else that follows. Um, and I see it all the time because, you know, I've been involved the last couple of years, um, very heavily involved in the NHL draft. So mm-hmm. I screen like 250 prospects a year up and coming Um, draft prospects and you know it's a big part or it was it's been a big part of our draft process and showing the value looking beyond my job is looking beyond the equipment right who is the person what is their character how resilient are they what is their mindset like Mm -hmm. and why is that well in a draft process you know we see all the time first round picks people that were touted to be the next up and coming and they never fulfill their potential. And I really, you know, I come back to, they have the talent curse. There's a curse for me sometimes that they were so talented. It was so easy for them all the way through. They were the best out there. They never had to fight. They never had to struggle. They never had to access that resilient muscle. Mm. And now they're at the top level, right? And now everybody around them is good. They have to earn their place and they're not used to doing that. Mm-hmm. And they haven't strengthened that resilient muscle and they're falling apart. And so that's why we see a lot of draft busts yeah. and flip that the other way around. You know, it's, it was an interesting stat we did 
I think it was from the 2017 season, so a few years back, but um, it, we looked at NHL players and their draft rounds, like the round that they were drafted in, and how many of them went on to play successful careers in the NHL. And we obviously expect the first rounders, we hope that, you know, those are the guys that are going to make it. And I think it was at a first round, it was still only in the 30%. So you could be a first round pick, right? With unbelievable talent and mm -hmm. only 30 something percent of them actually play at the highest level. So like I say, it's hard to get there. Mm -hmm. Then it, there's a dip to the second round. And then after that, the next highest percentage of people that actually played were the undrafted players. Mm. So at 18 years old, they weren't really on anybody's radar. Nobody was interested in them. And yet, right, I'm sure a devastating day for them. They did not get picked on draft days. They waited for their name. They got passed by. And then not only did they make it to the NHL, many of them have had very successful careers. And we could look at any sport, not just hockey. You look at a Tom Brady, right, in football. So it takes a lot more than talent if you really want to get to the highest level. I love that. I love that. And all, all, the, all the things we've been focusing on at the moment is about how to get the best out of an individual through the power of their mind. How do we, how do we transpose that onto the leadership so that we can affect many minds in a positive way? Yeah, well, it, it comes back to that growth piece for me. Mm -hmm. In terms of leadership, I'm always trying to promote an atmosphere, like leaders need to promote an atmosphere of growth and opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like cultivating an environment for growth. That's, that's, again, it's the biggest thing that drives success. Always better than yesterday. If, mm -hmm. if a leader in whatever realm, sport, business, life, it doesn't matter, if a leader cultivates that type of environment within those they lead, right? And that's a really different form of leadership from maybe what we've seen long ago mm. in the past that was more authoritarian type of leadership, fearful, pressure-oriented, like, mm -hmm. you know, succeed, win, or else. Again, for me, it just promotes fear, anxiety. It's just, it's taking us mm. out of our peak potential, um, and, and what we're capable of doing. So I, I would create a love of learning. I want leaders to create a love of learning within the people that they lead. Really that mindset of, you know, we're getting 1% better. And that's what I push for every single day is 1% better. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're at the top of the team, at the bottom of a team, at the top of your game or not. Mm -hmm. When we ask for 1% better, right? Like little by little, we stack these small steps because sometimes things yeah. can feel overwhelming to people. And so if I ask for 1%, give me 1% today. Mm. Let's get 1% better than yesterday, right? You can do 1% and that's going to hold true whether we had the best day of our life, the best performance or the worst performance. And, you know, sometimes things are heartbreaking. Like I say, there is when we're trying so hard, when something's meaningful to us, yes, it is disappointing. I'm not taking any of that heartache away. I feel it. I'm just as competitive as the next guy. But I ask that same question every single day from the people that I lead, whether you had the best performance of your life or the worst performance and the biggest heartache, the next day is, how are we going? Give me 1%, right? So it's not judgmental. It's it's recognizing that there will be ups and downs. It's human, you know. Um, there's always going to be variation in performance. There are variables that are not within your control. And so it's that consistent strive for growth, learning, and opportunity. And we can do 1%. And if we do 1%, and then the next day 1%, and the next day 1%, mm -hmm. it's manageable. And we start stacking those, you know. Um, that's how we start growing into something, you know, a year later, if we've stacked mm. 1 every single day, and then we're going to be exponentially better from wherever it is we started. Um, mm. But it's that that's fear awesome. that holds people back, right? 
Yeah, the VP of marketing for Disney, he talked about um, that you brought an element of fun to your workshop. Yeah. I come from a policing background, there ain't no time for fun. I no. really believe in fun too, but why, why, why do you bring an element of fun to your learning environment? Yeah, fun is important for me. Um, it's engaging, you know, I think, I mean, I'd love to chat with you too. I got a lot of questions for you because coming from a policing background, that tends yeah. to be more authoritarian and more pressure oriented um mm -hmm. but fun for me it's like sticky it's going to engage with people yeah. if i can't get their buy-in well first first off we got to get buy-in right mm -hmm. i got to get them to think that i have something valuable to share with them or they're not going to be really interested um so i got to get buy-in i have to have good value to offer yeah but then it's got to be fun i think people's attention spans are not so long these days and so it's got to be sticky how am I going to share my message in a way that's going to mm. stick and connect for them um, especially if I'm giving a big presentation when I'm one-on-one -on -one, it's more engaging mm. but if I'm giving a big presentation or talking to a big group or a team you know I would say when I come into a team or a room that doesn't know me you've got I, I say like 30 30 30 you've got about 30 percent of people that are already really interested in what you're going to say mm -hmm. 30 to 33% that are kind of indifferent and probably 30, 33% that are like, uh, you know, why do I have to sit through this kind of yeah. thing? I don't want to be here. So um, when I can grab them and I always try and do that, whatever message I'm giving, I always try and tell either a story that's engaging or an activity that really highlights my message. Cause that's what I think creates these like, ah, oh, like aha moments, you know, mm -hmm. I can tell you, mm -hmm. but if you experience it or you can relate to it for yourself, that's an aha moment. And I'm going to get a lot further with people when I do that. So it's a big part of my work. I love that. I, I know that you talk about a big why. What's your own big why? What's my why? Okay. Well, my why is I, I am driven. I'm so passionate by success and Success looks different for every single person, but my why is, is helping even me achieve my highest level of potential, my children, my family, my friends, and everybody that I touch, like the work that I do, that's my why. Life is short. You know, we are on this earth for a limited time. Why not make the most of it? You know, so I'm really, my why is to empower potential and live your best life so that's that's why I do what I do it, you know, it comes back to I don't know if you saw you've done your research Ryan so you know a lot about me um well, I could just see the big smile on your face when you talk about it yeah it's it's it it energizes me and mm. and when I see it and you know like I said life is not inseparable from pain and adversity um mm. and it's all part of part and parcel of the process but when you can mm go through that with somebody. Um, I mean, I'm a big relationship person. So connection is very important to me. Mm. And so um, being able to connect with people and then do what I do is so powerful yeah. for me. And it, it really does energize me. It's, it's a high, like it's a natural high for mm. me to um, build relationships and, you know, to be part of a team or to have worked with an athlete for years and been with them really through their struggles and their ups and their downs and then to see them triumph and to achieve something great. It's, it's drives me. It's, it's my why for sure. For sure. I love that. We'll encourage people to go check out your book, but what is the top tip? Number one tip you'd love to share with our, our audience from that book today. The number one tip I think would be, I mean, like we already talked about the whole basis of fear is just, you can be afraid and you can do it anyways. Um, obviously you need to prepare yourself, you know, and mm -hmm. the book would help you do that mentally, physically, whatever it is you're doing, prepare, make sure you have the skill set. But if I could summarize it into one tip for you, it's going to be trust. And that's just trust yourself that you'll figure it out. So mm -hmm. it's a big part of my story. Um, Honestly, I tell people half the time, I didn't know what I was doing. Like, it's true yeah. because 
every time you hit a new level, it's the first time you do anything and it's completely out of your comfort zone. And how are you ever supposed to know what to do unless you step into the fire and literally mm. figure it out. So, you know, I go back to a story from, um, you may or may not have not heard it on my website, but um, it was in first grade for me. And like I said, I, I had a passion for sport. I loved hockey ever since I was a little girl. My room was wall to wall hockey pictures. And, you know, I, had, I grew up with two brothers and people would come into my house and they thought that it was the boys room and not my mm -hmm. room. And, but it was just a thing for me ever since I was little. And in first grade, um, I remember being excited and nervous to go to school the first day. And um, I got into my seat and it's probably one of my first and most distinct memories. The teacher went around the room and, you know, she is asking everybody the, the big question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was patiently waiting for my turn and I was excited because I knew my answer and, you know, my heart was pounding a little bit and I was waiting to stand up and, and say my thing. And it finally got to me and I was excited and nervous and I, I stood up and I, I said really proudly that I want to be in the NHL when I grew up mm -hmm. and the whole class like burst into laughter. And I remember my heart like sunk into my chest. It yeah. was like a hit in my stomach. I was like, Oh, why are they all laughing at me? You know? And yeah. so I kind of sat down and I was a little bit defeated for a moment. And, and after that passed, I allowed my emotion to pass. And, and that's the other interesting thing is, emotions are changing all the time. So we don't need to give in to, you know, whatever we're feeling, we can just allow it to be and it will move through us. And mm -hmm. so my heart, you know, slowed down eventually and I took a deep breath. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, like what do you mean I can't? Like, why can't I? You know, then mm -hmm. they said, well, you're a girl, like you can't be in the NHL. But I don't know, it was just something that just said like, why not? Why not mm -hmm. me? And so, you know, I say today, maybe I didn't play in the NHL, but I just found another way to get there. And Absolutely. I'm exactly I where I wanted to be. I've achieved, you know, sort of my highest goal possible. And it's simply because I believe that I could figure it out. And, that, and mm -hmm. through every step of the way, every level I hit, you know, the first time I walked into professional sport, it was like, it was me in a room with 50 hockey men, you know, and um, I, I, I remember being so nervous. I literally, I'm like, excuse myself for a second. I had to go to the bathroom to try and catch my breath because I was giving a one hour presentation and I knew it was my moment like to get their buy-in because I, I was different. I changed the dynamic of a room. They weren't used to having a female in there. Mm. Um, but I took a deep breath and just, you know, I just went with it. So I love it. That's such yeah. a powerful story. And, and I think testament to anyone out there that gets laughed at. And I'm just so glad that you decided to get better and didn't let it yeah. make you bitter. That's right. Yeah, I actually have a, a cool post I did probably about a month. Oh, no, not a month ago, even a week ago on my did you see that the, on my Instagram? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you can. And it's true. It's, it's our choice. Like, what are we going to do with it? And that's, mm -hmm. again, why I believe talent is overrated because you could have all the natural talent in the world. And if you're frustrated and down on yourself because somebody's giving you a hard time, it's really hard to get anywhere. So it really is mm -hmm. a choice. Like, are you going to choose to be bitter or are you going to choose to be better? Because, you know, stuff will always happen, especially if you're trying to achieve great things. So your choice. You know, mm. I, I love your story too. You were like initially just sharing with me how you left your job and just yeah. decided to podcast. And, you know, I, I, maybe you can share a little bit too, because I'm sure when you started, you didn't know mm. what you were doing. Like, no, a hundred percent. And I, you know, and I, and I think, um, I've never been quite the perfectionist, but it was always that case. If you look at other people, they've got the microphones, they've got the headset, mm -hmm. they've got the, they've got all the production value. And I, I was just the guy that cared about having good conversations with people. Yeah. So I had to put all that to one side and just, I set about doing what I could with what I had, yeah. you know, and I uh, had great conversations with my friends. Someone said, Hey, you should share it on a podcast. I was like, what's that? How do I do that? <laughs> so I never, I you know, this, this probably deeply offends all the hardcore podcasters no, out there. I but love it. I, my, my intentions were just to have good conversations with good people. And, um, I think great things happen when you show up every single week with a genuine care and curiosity for, for people. And 
it, it give, and here's the here's the life giving thing about doing your heart work is that you it gives you energy like you said it energizes yeah. you and you yeah. help people at the same time and it's that reciprocal energy that just you know and the thing i've yeah. really had to learn is to leave space for the miracles you know i've been so busy trying to control everything my entire life that um yeah i'm with you there too. <laughs> it, it, it kind of causes you some unnecessary pain and, and 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 in terms of the bitter not you know not bitter get better like the reality is i got bitter for yeah. a period of time yeah. until i got back to being better yeah yeah and, and we do occasions. we do ryan you know even i say i'm supposed to be an expert in this there are moments that you know i'm down and i'm not in the right headspace either and you're human and your experience is human and so is mine and so i again i think all those emotions they're normal and i think sometimes we have to just allow ourselves to be in that place because if we use it the right way it's going to be our biggest lesson it's going to be our biggest opportunity for mm -hmm. growth so it's not about escaping the pain and it's not about struggling it's about embracing it and turning it into an advantage if we never struggle mm -hmm. we're never gonna get anywhere right it's everything success is beautiful and I'm all about it right and it's what I do but um I celebrate it but we're not growing so much there where we truly grow is in the moments of struggle and the moments mm. of heartache if we choose to use it in the right way so we don't want to get stuck in that bitterness I have a famous line that I always say and you know I have many people that actually have it up on their fridge it's really become a sticky one which is um don't get stuck in the suck <laughs> and um, I don't even know if I learned that from Justin Sua, maybe, but <laughs> I learned it definitely at a ASP sports psychology conference. And I know uh, Justin and I were both there and it came out of that conference, but don't get stuck in the suck. Find mm. an opportunity in life, in sport, in whatever it is we do. You know, sometimes things just suck. It's mm. not always about you know, being positive and like rah, rah, like it's not always, it doesn't always feel that way. And sometimes we are wronged or bad things happen and, um, and it sucks. And mm. I appreciate that in my athletes. I don't ever try and take that away from them. Um, and, it, and I honor that in myself too. Sometimes things don't feel good. And I allow myself, I think it's important to be in that space and not deny your feelings, right? It's yeah. just about using them the right way. Um, I think if we push our feelings away, then, you know, we can't really grow through them and then mm -hmm. they'll get leaked in other ways. So I really am about honoring that and acknowledging sometimes things suck, yep. but we have a choice, get stuck in it or find an opportunity. It's our best mm -hmm. lesson. That's really powerful. And um, at, normally at this point in the interview, I'd ask, what does the phrase always better than yesterday mean to you? But we have woven yeah. that throughout the entire conversation. So yeah. let me just say thank you for your time out of your day. Really love connecting with you. How can our audience connect and find out more about your work? Um, so they can check out my website, which is brenleyshapiro.com. Um, I'm going to be launching soon. It's coming soon. I'm a little behind schedule, but I'm going to be launching an online community um, where it's going to be really a community to learn, network, and grow exactly like we're talking about. And for me, it's really going to be a, just an opportunity to mentor people in a, on a larger scale. Um, and be able to have a touch point with more people and support one another. So that's coming. And certainly follow me on Instagram, which is Brenly Shapiro. And you'll find out, uh, you know, all about what I'm doing and just great little mindset tips to get better every single day. Love that. I love that. Thank you so much for your time. I'd be honored if you could leave us a final thought from your good self. Oh, well, my final thought would be just thank you for having me. Uh, I want to circle back to what you said just about great conversations because this was a great one and so I thank you for that uh, it's just been a pleasure talking to you and you know you followed your heart and your passion I followed mine as well and my final message were, will be for everybody just find your heart mm. and trust yourself to figure it out I love that Brenly thank you so much Ryan thank you nice to connect and uh, hope to to be in touch soon always <laughs>